Friends, I'm going to be honest, it's a little bit intimidating to stand here this morning because I'm not used to preaching to a church quite this full. And what a great feeling it is to look out there and to see all of God's people. And most of us are awake and smiling this morning. And that's a wonderful thing. As I get ready to expound on the Word of God this morning, I just, something that was just sticking with me this week as I was up in the mountains and working on preparing this sermon is that it really doesn't matter when we come here why we are here. We don't come here of our own volition. We don't come here because we think it's the right thing to do. We really come here because God was first faithful to us. And as I was looking at the scripture, which I'll share with you in a minute, the one word that really stuck out to me, or the one phrase that Paul uses is, God is faithful. And that faithfulness brings us here this morning. I want to share with you the Word of God. It comes to us from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, first nine verses, where we hear these words from Paul. And Paul writes, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be His holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of His grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in Him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. My dear friends, this is the Word of God this morning for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now as we look at this scripture this morning, at first glance, this is just Paul's normal greeting in all the letters he writes, right? It's like, okay, it's me, it's Paul. Here's some brothers and sisters that I'm with, and here's who I'm writing to, and you know, the familiar grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he, he goes on to start buttering up his recipients before he really gets into the meat of his letter. I mean, this is typical Paul writing here to the Corinthians. He seems to be congratulating them as he's getting ready to speak to them. But I want you to just step back from the familiar that we know from reading Paul's letters. Just step back for a minute and I want you to notice who the main actor is here as Paul is talking. The main actor is not Paul. I mean, he just quickly introduces himself. The main actor is not the, the church in Corinth. Although he introduces them, the main actor in what Paul is speaking about today is God. God is the main actor, and it culminates with the very end of this scripture with Paul's declaration that God is faithful. So we started last week this new sermon series that we'll be in for about six weeks talking about a new year, which we focus in on making ourselves better with New Year's resolutions. And praise God, I hope that none of y'all are here this, this Sunday morning because you made a New Year's resolution to go to church more. I, I hope that it's something far deeper than that. But we, we started with, with this idea of New Year, but God's same old promises. And so last week we talked about God's promise of new life through our waters of baptism. This week we are going to celebrate God's promise of faithfulness. When we think about the story that we call our life, we tend to like to write the script in such a way that we are the hero of our own story. And any good script writer would do that, right? They're going to they're gonna pick themselves as the hero of the story. I think back to a book that I had to read in high school, and I know many of you probably did. Does anybody uh, remember the, the book or the series of books called Anne of Green Gables? 
Well, there was a lady in this series. Her, her name was Miss Cornelia. And she was that lady like we all know. Good, solid, faithful, church-going lady. But she always kind of had her nose in everybody in town's business. She knew exactly what was going on. And she inquires about the, the health of... Uh, she's talking to a woman there in town. She inquires about the health of a mutual acquaintance. And her friend says, oh dear, it is really bad. I'm afraid the Lord is the only one that can help her now. And Miss Cornelia, as faithful and as pious as she is, she gasps and she goes, oh, please don't say it's that bad, right? You see, when we're the hero of our own story, we're the ones that have the power over everything in our lives. And when we get to a point when nothing else will work, when we can't fix it ourselves, or we can't find the people in this world to fix it for us, then we have to leave it in God's hands. And when we do that, we look at that as, boy, I have sure failed as the hero of my own story. And this is my last ditch effort that only God can help help me now. You know, as your pastor, I see this quite a bit, and, and I'm not shaming you for this. I'm just putting it out there as something that I've noticed. When I go out and do pastoral care visits uh, and, and do home visits with y'all, um, you know, I usually come in and say, hey, how's things going? Or, or how is it with you? How, how, how's life treating you? And it's almost always, especially with our older congregation, a litany of all of our medical conditions, but then it's always uh, 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 a proclamation of what our doctors are doing to fix that, right? Well, I went to the doctor last Tuesday and he said that I've got high blood pressure and, and he's going to put me on a new blood pressure medication. You know, and we'll, we'll talk about that for a long time. And I very rarely hear anybody say, you know... I'm having some health problems, but man, I'm really trusting in God. And God is using the doctors in a mighty way to heal that. You see, we are the hero of our own story. Even when we don't recognize it and we tell that story, God is always relegated to a cameo appearance when the hero can't solve the problem. You see, we are by nature fixers and doers, right? We don't have the patience to wait on God to do things, especially when he works so much in the background. We want to step forward and grab that bull by the horns and get to work. You know what? We're no different than the ancient Israelites in that matter. In fact, I remember a story way, 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 way back when the Israelites were first brought up out of Egypt. And God is with Moses and God is talking directly to Moses and saying, Moses, here's where I want you to go and here's what I want you to do. Oh, by the way, let's, let's stop and camp out for a couple of months over here by this place called Mount Sinai. And Moses, I want you to come up here on top of the mountain and talk to me for a while. And Moses goes up and he's up there for 40 days and God is writing the Ten Commandments and the rules of the covenant down on stone tablets. And what do you think Aaron and his followers are doing at the bottom of the mountain? They're like, well, where's Moses? He's been gone for over a month now. And the Israelites are like, well, we got to do something. We got to have something to worship. Aaron, why don't you take and make a golden calf for us to worship? You see, they wanted to be the hero of their own stories, even though God with a mighty outstretched hand brought them up out of Egypt. When, the, when things slowed down and they didn't see what God was doing, they're like, hey, let's do things our way. You see, when we're the hero of our own story, very rarely do we make room for God's promise of faithfulness to us. So what happens as the hero of our story when we fall short? And my friends, I'm here to promise you this morning that we will always fall short when we're our own hero. Well, when we think about faithfulness, how often do we think about faithfulness in terms of God being faithful? Honestly, for me, when I think about faithfulness, I think it's something that I've got to do. Once again, I'm the hero of my story, so faithfulness has to come from me. I mean, after all, God's here every day waiting for me to come into the house of God, to be here on Sunday morning. But it's my faithfulness that draws me in here, right? It's got to be something that I do. 
We see this a lot with misguided Christians. When somebody um, is sick or faces a loss, and we tell them, just have faith and pray, right? God will make it better. Well, what happens if that person's sickness is not healed? What happens if that person on death's door ends up dying anyway? How often do we go to them, or we know somebody goes to them and says, you know, maybe you just didn't pray hard enough, or maybe you just didn't have enough faith. If you'd have just had more faith, this wouldn't have happened. Because once again, we try to make ourselves the hero of the story. So that faith has to come from us. And if, if, if that person dies or the sickness doesn't relent, it must have been something that we did or didn't do. But here's the deal. We are saved by faith. The Bible's pretty clear on that. We can't work our way into heaven. We are saved by the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. And I'm not here to refute that fact. That much is true. But did you realize that ultimately it's not even our own faith that saves us? But it is God's faithfulness to us. It is God's faith. It is God's faith in us that we will come to accept Jesus as our Savior. It's God's faithfulness to us to not rescind that offer of salvation to us. I think about when Abraham takes his only son Isaac and God's like, I know I promised you I'd give you that son in your old age, but now I want him back. I want you to take him over to the mountain and I want you to take him to the top of that mountain, build an altar, tie your son up, lay him on it, cut his throat and offer him to me as a burnt offering. Here's the thing, Abraham, he was willing to do it. And the Bible credits that to him as faith and righteousness. But it was truly the faithfulness of God who said, I promised you to give you a son and through that son, Isaac, to make you a father of many nations. Now, God made that promise. Now, think about it. How is God going to be faithful to that promise if he allows Abraham to kill his own son? And just at the right time, God's like, oh, I think I get it. I think you have a heart for me, and I will provide you the right sacrifice. And Abraham looks over, and there's a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. God's faithfulness. Our faith means nothing before God's faithfulness. You see, when we try to do things ourselves and we fail... Or when we try to believe and we fail, we are crushed. We are crushed and there is no consoling us. And in those times when we try really, really hard to be good Christians and we fall short, or we believe really hard that God will deliver us from something and, and it doesn't happen the way we want it, we are crushed and it has caused many of spiritual, immature people, I call them spiritual babes, to fall away. The whole world is full of them. Yeah, I believed in God until, until this happened and, and I couldn't believe in a God that would allow that to happen. You see, they're still trying to do it their way. They're trying to be the hero of their own stories. We question God. We question His faithfulness. But I'm here to tell you that God's faithfulness is the only thing that we can hang our hat on in this world. Leaning on the true wellspring of faithfulness is what we have to do. And that wellspring does not spring up in us. That faithfulness comes from God Himself. You see, God never forgets His promises to us. Not once. Not ever. God is capable of remembering every promise He made for all eternity. And my friends, we have never, ever been called to be the first ones to be faithful. You think about it. God has never asked us to place our faith in Him, a blind faith, on a promise that He didn't first make to us. When He asks us to trust in Jesus, He just doesn't say, here's a man, trust in Him, for us to say, well, what's He doing for us? What is there to trust? No, He sent Jesus to pay our sin debt, to die on the cross for us, to rise from the grave victorious over our death, and then he says, this is what I want you to trust in. That I am sending you a Savior and my promises are faithful and trustworthy. 
Now, I want you to be faithful to that. You see, we are not called to be the only one to be faithful. God doesn't expect us to, to, to just give him blind devotion in a one way, uh, uh, on a one-way street here. God's like, I want you to trust in me because I first trust in you. I trust in, and this is God speaking, God says, I trust in humanity enough to know that even though they fell at the beginning of time to the temptation of sin, that there will come a day when everything will be made right. I trust that humans are still the ones that I want to have fellowship with. And I will provide a way to make everything right again. And that's his promise to us that he will provide that way. And then he says to us, now come and be faithful to me. I am first faithful to you. Now be faithful to me. Friends, we receive God's grace. We receive God's grace through his promise to be faithful to us. Now, true faithfulness that knows no equal only comes from one place, and that's from God. Now, I have proclaimed this morning that we mistakenly try to do it all by ourselves at times. That's just the human nature. That's just the way it is. That's we, we, and once again, I'm not necessarily chastising the church, but a couple of weeks ago, we had a couple of visitors. They walked in at an inopportune time, and it really upset us as a church because it wasn't our normal, right? And the first thing that we start thinking about is what can we do to mitigate the risk in this situation? Who do we have here that can provide us some comfort and security? And what will we do if this goes wrong? Instead of saying, you know what, God is faithful, God is trustworthy, and God will provide for us. You see, we try to do it all by ourselves because that's just our human nature. And when we do, we always fall short of success as measured by God's measuring stick. And when we do fail, and when we have nothing left to sustain us, it is God's faithfulness that sustains us. And the reason that is, is because the promise of God's faithfulness to us. Friends, God is faithful. His faithfulness calls us into a relationship with His Son, Jesus the Christ. Our faithfulness means nothing without that foundation of God's faithfulness to us. You see, it's a brand new year, my friends. But we can rely on God's same old, unchanging, timeless promises in our life. Like we talked about last week, we can rely on God's promise to give us new life through the waters of our baptism. And this week we learned that now we can also trust in God's promise of faithfulness to us. And friends, these promises are good news for you and for me today. In the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey folks, remember to click the subscribe button below and ring the bell to be notified when we post new content. And as always, if today's video touched you in some way, please hit the thumbs up button and leave us a comment. We love to hear how our content impacts your walk with Jesus Christ. Until next time, God bless.